One for mum, one for dad, one for the country. And there has never been a more exciting time to be in Australia. Dead, buried, cremated. Australia's basically done for. We'll just end up being a third-rate economy. You know, a banana republic. Just follow the money. G'day. And welcome to the summer special season of Follow the Money. I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute. And with the news that Indian company Adani has all but secured a $1 billion loan from the federal government for its massive Carmichael mine in the Galilee Basin, we decided to go hunting way back in our archive for this audio. It's former President Anote Tong of the small Pacific island nation of Kiribati, Few countries are feeling the impacts of global warming more than Kiribati, which sits just above sea level. President Tong visited Australia as a guest of the Australia Institute, and he gave this public talk in Melbourne just before he made his way to Paris for the climate talks, where he outlined his plan and his call for a global moratorium on new coal mines. Let me begin by, first of all, acknowledging and by paying my respects to the elders, past and present of this land, where we are gathering uh, this evening. In, in our culture, we, before we, we speak, we always uh, greet each other. So let me bless you in our traditional language. It's Kamnabarin uh, Maori, meaning may you all be blessed. And so your answer will be Maori. So let me say it again, Kamnabarin Maori. Thank you. So we're all blessed. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is, it is always a pleasure to be here in this very, very beautiful country of yours. You really don't know how blessed you are. And to be able to touch base with the people of this nation. We have always been a part of our Kiribati history. And of course, our development. Our relationship with Australia goes back many generations and has grown from strength to strength. Many of you don't know that uh, our currency is the Australian dollar. <laughs> Though we may be oceans apart, we are part of this single region. And most importantly, we are all part of this global community, citizens of this planet Earth, our one and only home. It is against this background that I am here this evening to share my people's story and my people's hope that their very survival as a nation, as a culture, and as peoples whose identity is at stake with the onslaught of climate change. And it is my people's hope that the world takes concrete steps towards reducing global emissions and taking collective responsibility, and more importantly, urgent action on the issue of climate change. One immediate and very possible, reasonable action is agreeing to a moratorium on coal. And I'm indeed very heartened by the growing support for that coal. But it's very clear that coal is not something that can and must and can continue to be used. The two degree target is indeed it's a dangerous one. You know, we, we debated. And I, for, for those of you that were not with us in Papua New Guinea when we had the Pacific Islands Forum meeting, there was a, a debate. Nobody knew what went on because nobody was there. It's only, it was only the leaders. So we never talk about it. But we did not agree. We agreed that uh, two degrees was not for us. But for some of us, it was something that they could not go beyond because it would hurt the industries. And later, of course, during the press conference, I re responded to say, of course, we, are, we understand. We understand that those of us whose economic growth is more important, two degrees is something that they cannot do. But those of us that cannot accept that, it's not about economic growth, it's not about politics, it is about the survival of our people. In the lead-up to COP21 in Paris, we as a collective whole should voice our concern, similar to our condemnation of any act of violence. We should condemn acts of eco-terrorism, similarly violent 
but perhaps in a more progressive, gradual form, but nevertheless much, much more destructive. My colleague from Tuvalu has said, this is a weapon of mass destruction. Uh, As responsible and moral leaders, we should take heed and we should act now. And what simpler way then to agree on the moratorium on the opening of new coal mines? I know that there is some confusion here because I was passing through Sydney some maybe two weeks ago and I was just reading the Sydney Morning Herald. And then in the, the letters to the editor, I think, and I saw my name there, and they said they were accusing me of saying that I was calling for a, whole, uh, a stop to any export of coal. No, it is not what I said. I know what I am talking about. <laughs> because I know what happens in the colder climates. I know that they cannot do without energy. And it, we cannot do, turn off the coal immediately. It is something that it would need time to transition from. So, let it be heard that all I was asking was a moratorium on the opening of new coal mines because it would reflect our sincerity in our commitment to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. And in my view, coal was perhaps the worst offender in this respect. And so, I thought it was a very reasonable suggestion. I, I like to think that I am a reasonable person. But it seems that that is being misinterpreted, perhaps deliberately. But I am also mindful of the, the reality that your Prime Minister, the current one, is, is talking about... <laughs> no, I didn't do the last one, and I won't do the next one. <laughs> the current Prime Minister, I think, I know very carefully worded statement that he's not talking about the moratorium on the opening of new coal mines. He's not rejecting that but he's rejecting their misinterpretation of what it is that I have said. And so he's rejecting the, the suggestion that the uh, export of coal should cease immediately. So I think I take that as being very significant. The urgency and the unparalleled threat to my people, to all of those people who are on the front line of climate change, and all those people on the coastlines. You know, what's got to be understood and appreciated is it's not simply about us. It's about people here on the coastlines of Australia. You're lucky because those of you on the coastline because you've got somewhere to move back. And I've been at meetings where I speak and, you know, these very smart people say, oh, why don't you move back? I say, if I move back, I'll fall on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the danger that it poses not only to, our, to my people, but all of those people who are on the front line of climate change should never really be underestimated. The science is telling us quite categorically that there is serious trouble ahead of us. The question is, do we deny it? Do we ignore it? Or do we take concrete action about it now? There are some very, very smart people, you know, who, you know, I'm not a Rhodes Scholar, but my common sense tells me from the science that I am reading that um, there is danger ahead of us. What continues to confuse me is why can we not take the right course of action? Because the right course of action, to me, seems very clear. And it's not about procrastinating. It's not about continuing to, to argue that it's, uh, it's two degrees because otherwise we would go into economic recession. It's about the security of real people today and into the future. I believe it is imperative that we do not simply pay lip service to an issue that at the heart of it is the very survival and the future of people, men, women, and children whose very cultures, whose communities, villages, cities, and nations are at stake. Is there any other important consideration than the future of our children, our grandchildren, and their children? Is that more important or less important than economic development? 
I pose the question. And I seek a sensible answer. If I was a professor in the University of Melbourne, I think a lot of your leaders would not pass. <laughs> <laughs> Yet, we know what the right thing to do is. Yet, we continue to press, procrastinate. We continue to ignore the science and what it's telling us. And unless there is a drastic shift in political and global leadership, our inaction will, for certain, take us over the edge, if it has not already done so. It has been said that coal mining will reduce poverty levels. And I think that is the argument that many climate activists sometimes get stalled and don't know how to respond. But I tell you, it ignores the fact that there are so many other costs, and we are one of those costs. What is the value of our future? What is the value of our culture, the future of our children and grandchildren? That has not been taken into consideration. Do you really believe that these people who want to dig up Kamako, do you really believe they care about the poor in India? Seriously, you know, you, one has got to be so gullible to be able to, to absorb that kind of an argument. And the real question is, does coal really address the poverty issues in the developing world? We are poor, yet coal will not address our poverty. What we have done in our part of the world is, uh, as a government, we made a commitment last year and into this year to light up all the homes every home on the Outer Islands. And so we did that. So now every home is lit by a solar lamp. And we have changed their lives, we have changed it. Yet we've done so without burning any coal. <laughs> the Tokelaus are 100% renewable energy. Tonga is on the way to doing that. Many of the Pacific Island countries are on the way to uh, reducing their dependence on fossil fuel. So it is doable. And so let us not put forward the argument. I think the argument that is being put forward is simply to perpetuate the interest of those people whose profit and loss statement depends on coal. And so we have not asked for the world to cease co-production immediately. We are simply asking that the world stop building new mines. For failure to do so is basically forfeiting the, those of us who have the greatest to lose from the impacts of climate change. In support of relatively small and wealthy interest groups such as the coal industry. Let me share with you. I've, I've been written a letter from the coal industry and they wrote to me. And I don't know these guys. <laughs> but they wrote to me and uh, they, they had uh, the cheek to say, you know, you're wasting your time. You know, you're waste, you really are wasting your time. Don't bother to keep doing this because coal will continue to be the source of energy in the future. And so I was angry, of course, and I wanted to respond, but uh, my senior advisor said, don't bother, that's not worth it. <laughs> but I, I'm still not satisfied. I, I wish I had written back. <laughs> I'm here today as part of my ongoing advocacy against a threat not only to my people but to the whole of humankind which if not addressed has the potential to wipe out life as we know it and that has got to be understood. Coal moratorium as I referred to earlier is uh, my expectation is it would be the first of many steps. It was my belief that it's the easiest step and if it's not acceptable come up with alternatives so that we are really are talking about cutting down, down our emissions because what we don't want to happen is a grand commitment but no real action. And so the test will be in Paris. The Pacific Islands in the historic Suba Declaration just earlier this, um, a few months back shared a position which uh, taking 
to Paris for the COP meeting. And we have jointly called for a new global dialogue on the implementation of an international moratorium on the development and expansion of fossil fuel extracting industries, in particular, the construction of new coal mines as an urgent step towards decarbonizing the global economy. Globally, our call has drawn diverse support, eminent persons, and I think uh, Sir Nicholas Stern, uh, as uh, Professor Flurry has already said, has commented on this, and I was so happy to, to have his support. He really is an authority on this. He's the economist, and so he's telling us that uh, coal is bad economics. And so if we are serious about sustainable future, then we must get off coal as soon as possible. In time, we must get off at the fossil fuel. I believe that the world as a whole will understand that renewable energy is the only option and one that makes the most economic sense. Against this background, it is my genuine hope that this wonderful country of yours will be able to take the lead on this issue that is critical to its neighbors. Australia is a, a big brother, one that should be standing by us when bullies from the other side of the world come. Okay? We don't want to be bullied by our brothers. I think you know, we all have families, and when the bigger boy, your bigger son bullies the, the younger brother, it's not on. And so likewise, this is not on. I recall that uh, when Australia was seeking membership on the Security Council, it called on its neighbors, Pacific Island countries, for support. And it, the support was extended on the basis that climate change would be taken up to the Security Council as a security issue. Okay? You know, there was a, lot, a tremendous loss of faith when there was a, just 100% a, a about 10. And we asked the question, we asked ourselves, why did we vote? I don't know if our vote made any real difference. But it was a vote of confidence in the bigger brother to do something about something that is threatening our, our very survival into the future. And so it's all about our children, our grandchildren, and indeed the future of this world. So for their sake, let us do what is right for them. Before I close, I would like to take this opportunity to express my deep appreciation for all of those who have lent, voiced their support. And I also invite those that have supported silently to voice their support out loud, because it is important. I know that a lot of people have been working hard on this. I know there's a lot of lobbying, because I know the, uh, the energy companies spend a lot of money lobbying. I heard a statement by one prominent professor, Michael Mann, uh, he was asked the question, what, what, what do you think about these uh, climate deniers? And what he said was very, very clear. He said, oh, those people are, are funded by the energy companies. And my feeling is that the majority of Australians are in support of climate action. But the question is, why are your politicians not doing it? What compromises the sense of what is right? I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. But let me take this opportunity to thank everybody, all of you for coming here to share the story and tell it beyond these rooms. Tell it, you know, with authority. I know that uh, our mistake in the past was standing by the sideline while decisions were taken in the boardrooms in the United States, in Europe, now in Japan, and now they're being taken maybe in India. They're being taken here in Australia. We cannot afford to stand by the sideline because our future generation, generation would never forgive us for doing that. So let us work together in partnership to do the right thing. Let us work together in partnership to convince those that continue to need convincing that if they don't do this, they will go to hell. <laughs> That's been episode 14 of Follow the Money, brought to you by the Australia Institute. 
You can find more links to the Australia Institute's research on climate change and our campaign for no new coal mines in the podcast show notes on our website at tai.org.au forward slash podcasts. You can also find links to our previous episodes of Follow the Money there. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you enjoyed it, please do share it with friends and leave a rating on iTunes. It helps other people to find it. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.